This is Somewhere in the Skies with Ryan Sprague. So, welcome everyone to the Blue Ribbon Panel. Hopefully, the National Enquirer will do no, no will take no legal action against us today. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're we're stealing it. Uh, I am joined today by an illustrious group of podcasters, and this evening we will be presenting you all with some obscure UFO stories, and we'll be taking some of your questions too. Uh, our first panelist is an author, UFO researcher. You've seen him on your TV screen recently, and he is the host of the Somewhere in the Skies podcast, Ryan Sprague. Ryan, how you doing, what buddy? Hi, man. Good. It's so, I'm so happy to be talking to you again, man. Many people uh, in my audience know you from UFO Happy Hour, so this is the ultimate UFO Happy Hour, in my opinion. <laughs> so thanks for having me, man. Yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. Uh, next up, he, too, is an author, UFO researcher. You may have seen him on various TV programs yourself, including, I know, his personal favorite, Hangar One. <laughs> uh, Yay! He, he is uh, also the host of Unknown, a UFO podcast. He is Jason McClellan. Jason, how you doing, buddy? I am fantastic, sir. I'm excited to be here. And Ryan is right. I mean, this is the ultimate happy hour. So cheers, guys. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Here's my man. Next up, he is one of the founders of the Fourth Hand Media Network, also a Bon Jovi super fan, and one of the hosts <laughs> of Hysteria 51. For hand! You know, 90% of that isn't true, but I'm not going to say which part of it. But, Rob, everyone, thank you guys for having me. I feel a little cheated. I'm drinking Diet Mountain Dew. <laughs> I didn't get the memo, but I'll take it. So, <laughs> happy to be here. That's fine. I've got water this evening. so I think the memo said drink Clorox or something. Yeah. So I, I told one. you, it. I have a, a main line started. You just can't see it. It's right off camera. So. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the final panelist here, he holds a PhD in chemical engineering. He's the host of the Mad Scientist podcast and the eternal enemy of UFO Twitter. It's Chris Cogswell. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Yes. <laughs> I can say I'm not that kind of doctor, but please don't drink this. <laughs> not not going to work. Not a cure for what ails you. Yes. No, it is not a cure for what will ail you. But, uh, yes, welcome, everyone. It is really great to have you here. And uh, to uh, everyone out there that's tuning in, we're going to share some great UFO stories with you. Uh, we have all picked our brains to find the best ones. Chris Cogswell overthought this thing a million times through. That's how much he really cares about this right now. So uh, <laughs> when we're done with the stories, we're going to take your questions, but uh, just hold on to those and I'll let you all know when to send those in. But uh, uh, the first story, Ryan, kick us off with the first story, man. Yeah, so uh, this was an interesting one. I don't know if it's going to be as compelling as um, a lot of the other ones, but I found it really interesting. You don't hear about this often. And this was a train, or I should say a UFO colliding with a train. Uh, this happened back in 2002. And I've got my extensive notes here, so I'm just going to, I'm a slave to a script, man. So <laughs> if I'm reading from a script, I apologize. But um, all right, so this happened around 3 a.m. on January 14th, 2002. Uh, a coal train was traveling through Kentucky, and as the train neared the, um, the town of Paintsville, um, the conductor and other workers on this coal train, they actually noticed um, these strange lights over the tracks ahead of them. So, you know, the conductor thought maybe this was an oncoming train on another track going the opposite way. So he's like, I'm going to dim my lights, you know, do the right thing so I don't blind them on their way. And um, he dims the lights. And as soon as he does this, the train is starting to go around a bend, like there's a mountain on the other side. And um, he dims the lights and the lights start coming towards them. So they're clearly not on a track. And he doesn't know what to do at this point. He's freaking out. Something's coming right at him. Meanwhile, there are other uh, workers on the train. They're looking out and they're actually seeing on the, I believe it was the right side of them, um, over a river on the other side, there were these three white luminous objects 
over the water with like searchlights looking down into the water. So this is pretty interesting. You got lights over the track. You've got these objects over the river. And um, the, the guys who were looking at the things over the river said that they were pretty big. They were um, solid objects. Uh, they were metallic and silver in color. And like I said, they were like some sort of lights looking down into the water. So everyone starts freaking out. They don't know what the hell is going on. And um, the conductor starts to slow the train down. And as he does this, uh, the train, as it goes just around the bend, it just, everything goes haywire. Um, the train computers start malfunctioning. The emergency brakes kicked in. And he's like, holy crap, I'm about to crash into whatever this thing is. And um, they did. The light actually clipped the top of the train and um, hit a few times and then completely disappeared out of sight after that. So the train goes into emergency mode and it takes about, I think they said almost a mile for it to actually stop uh, fully. And when they um, when they finally report this to their, their dispatcher, um, this was out of Jacksonville, Florida, they, they said, okay, get to Paintsville and uh, we'll examine it from there. We'll, we'll, we'll get in touch with the people there. So they finally get to Paintsville and um, the conductor and all the workers get off and they see that the first two cars of the train were completely demolished. There were dents and scrapes everywhere, um, charred and burnt marks. And um, another, another um, latched on train behind the first two also was damaged pretty badly. So once they're getting to the Paintsville station, uh, they see a bunch of people there. So like, okay, this is all the people at the station. They're going to come check it out with us. And as they get to the station and get off the train, they notice that these don't seem to be railroad workers um, of any kind. They're just a ton of people dressed in black. And immediately they start going to the train and start inspecting it and looking at it. And meanwhile, the conductor, the main witness, as we'll call him, he said that a gentleman only known as Ferguson uh, came up to him, shook his hand, introduced himself, didn't say who he worked for, why he was there, but he said, let's, let's go inside and talk for a little bit. So they go inside and they question this main witness uh, for, he said, like almost an hour, just asking hundreds and hundreds of questions about what he'd seen, uh, what happened, this, that, this, that. Meanwhile, all the other people that had worked on the train, they were all huddled together and they, their phones were confiscated while they got medical examinations um, to make sure that they were all right, given their phones back. And after the um, sort of the inquisition was done, uh, they said, all right, we're going to let you go back on your train and get to your destination. Um, for national security purposes, please don't mention any of this to anyone. Please remain silent about it. And we'll act like this never happened. So they get back to their train. They get on to go um, out of Paintsville, and the three train cars that had been damaged were already gone, uh, just vanished. And the main witness said that there was a tent set up on the other side of the tracks, um, completely covered, shrouded. He assumes this is where the other train cars were um, for further inspection, investigation. I don't know. They all get on the train. They go about eight hours to their destination, turn around to go back to um, their original the original place and as they're going through paintsville everything's gone completely it's like this thing never happened um this is pretty interesting um it's just a story but what i found actually pretty interesting about it is there was a corroborating witness to possibly the same event we're not exactly sure a firefighter and a uh, paramedic were on their way from work and they said that as they were going down the road they saw towards the direction of Paintsville, they saw these huge luminous objects whiz past them at unbelievable speeds. And while they whizzed past, the car completely shut down, you know, close encounter style. And um, that was it. Uh, that was reported to New Fork, I believe. Um, and yeah, so this is an interesting one that I wanted to bring to you guys. I've never heard about a UFO colliding with a train. It is just a story. Um, Rob, you did bring to me a official report from, um, who was it, Ron, um, Mark Rodiger, excuse yeah. me, um, an official report where they 
they got in touch with this main witness and they hammered the dude to try to with you know see if he was legit they asked him all these questions about the train his job um what he'd seen the distance all this that this that and um they they came away thinking um mark and this other investigator he knows what he's talking about it seems like something happened so uh this one was really interesting to me again it's just a story um everyone remained anonymous that reported it um but i don't know we don't know what really happened there in paintsville but i thought it was a pretty exciting story to share with you guys so i'd love to get your thoughts on it it's uh i i remember first uh, seeing it uh, on Hangar One, like uh, it's, it's it's weird how many cases that show introduced me to because it, it's it's quite a few. Like, but uh, I remember just being like, "What? The a UFO hit a train?" And like, like really, it's it, it's kind of this obscure case that uh, I I know New Fork has uh, some information on it and um, a couple other places. But uh, yeah, it's it's one of those wild cases. Love it, I feel like I should be offended for people who work on trains. <laughs> Considering you, you're like, it don't look like normal train people. Like, what do normal train people look like, Ryan? What do you well, mean? They're everyone wearing, knows. They're wearing they, fancy suits and chairs. You no, know, they wear suspenders. Things. They've all got that same I hat. A bindle, a bindle on a stick? What are you talking about, bro? You're talking to the New York City guy, the city boy. <laughs> I don't. I don't know what train folk look like. A little known fact: oh, trains. God. Little known fact: trains were outlawed in New York in the late 1800s. So this is all foreign to him. <laughs> the people weird. on trains in New York, like the Long Island Expressway and things like that, they're different types of train people. So that's, that's yeah, no, true. there's yeah, there's it's a okay, different, Ryan. You have an excuse. I was gonna say the 1 a.m. train back to the Staten Island Ferry. That's a different kind of person. Different than kind the, of person. Uh, the noon into Midtown, right? That's that's a different kind of person. That's a good point, man. Yeah. So interesting. <laughs> oh man, that's such an interesting case. Yeah. I yeah. I know Jason, you were on Hangar One. Did you have any uh knowledge about this case? Um I know when I brought it to you guys early on, you kind of you kind of laughed it off. So I'm wondering um, what have you heard about this one, man, personally? I, I certainly didn't have anything to do with this case on Hangar One. Okay. Um, I'm pretty sure it was covered in uh, the second season, which I was not a part. Okay. Um, I was just in the first season, so no knowledge of it from the show. But I will say from, from the description of this case, you know, not, not to be a, a debunker, because uh, certainly you have to take in all of the, the different elements of this case, witness testimony, things like that. But the response, you know, certainly you could see it being the same for military recovering, you know, a top secret experiment gone wrong. Their response would have been the same. They would have swooped in, removed all evidence of said experiment going wrong and uh, sent people on their way. So just saying. Yeah. Uh, that, that's definitely a possibility. So uh, uh, Jace, we're going to uh, uh, move to your story now. So, uh, uh, Go ahead and uh, with your story that you got. Bring All the right. Well, the case I'm discussing today involves a strange incident that occurred way back on October 27th, 1954 in Florence, Italy. This one had 10,000 fans who were packed in a stadium that day for a football match. Now, of course, here we're talking about European football or soccer, as we call it here in the States. And just after halftime, the crowd fell silent as they saw this UFO appear over the stadium, both fans and players stopped. Like they stopped the game to look up at this weird object in the sky. And witnesses described being stunned by what they were seeing. One player even said that the UFO looked like an egg moving slowly through the sky. And if an egg moving through the sky isn't weird enough, he also said that glitter was coming down from the sky. Silver glitter. <laughs> Sounds like a party. <laughs> Other witnesses said they saw multiple cigar-shaped UFOs that were moving fast, but then stopped and just hovered in place. So we've got a mass UFO sighting here involving not just one, but multiple UFOs witnessed by thousands of people. That's cool. But let's get back to this glitter that was falling from the sky. This material is a strange sticky substance that has been reported in other UFO cases, and it's most often referred to as 
angel hair. Uh, several media outlets ran stories on this incident, but I believe it was the BBC that reported that multiple witnesses collected samples of this goo, this angel hair, and gave it to the Institute of Chemical Analysis at the University of Florence. So spectrographic analysis there revealed that this material came boron, silicon, calcium, and magnesium. So researchers knew the composition of the goo, but that's about it. They couldn't really determine what it was other than its composition. But when it comes to UFOs, there's always someone who knows the answers. And in this particular case, one person who loudly proclaimed he had all the answers was the notorious James Magaha. If you're not familiar with James Magaha, he's an astronomer and director of the Grasslands Observatory in Tucson, Arizona. He's also a retired Air Force pilot who held a top secret clearance and even worked at Area 51. But he's most known for being a hardcore UFO skeptic. His explanation for the 1954 mass UFO sighting, well, spiders. <laughs> he didn't start with spiders. Uh, when he initially looked at the case, he thought that a fireball meteor breaking up in the atmosphere could explain what people saw. But then he said it became fairly apparent that the sighting was actually caused by young spiders spinning webs. What? Okay, so he explained that migrating spiders use webs as sails. And when these link together, you get a big glob that spiders ride on to move between locations. That's true, they do that. I just wanna say that I love scientists and I love when scientists evaluate UFO or other paranormal events. Now, that being said, Magaha is a noted skeptic who relishes the opportunity to explain away any and all UFO sightings because to him, the UFO phenomenon is nothing but myth, magic, and superstition. He's said that from uh, time to time, and, and uh, that's what he lives by. But Robert Pinotti, he's the president of Italy's National UFO Center, disagreed with Magaha's fighter theory and one of the main reasons is the analysis done on the angel hair. The BBC pointed out that spider silk is a protein, an organic compound containing nitrogen, calcium, hydrogen, and oxygen, not the elements reportedly found in the samples by witnesses. Now, Philip Ball, who's a science writer and a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry, agreed that the spider theory sounded pretty flimsy. He explained that Magnesium and calcium are fairly common elements in living bodies. Boron and silicon, not so much. But if these were the main elements that the white fluff contained, it doesn't sound like they come from spiders. So that was his analysis. And then there were the 10,000 witnesses who watched the UFOs moving very fast and then stopping in the sky to hover. So as with most decades old UFO cases, it's unlikely that this mass UFO sighting will ever be definitively solved, no matter how hard people like James Magaha insist on ignoring witness testimony and scientific analysis. Weird case, guys. Weird case. Gotta love spiders and UFOs. Yeah, you, you definitely do. Uh, I think what's fascinating is that it ties into the 54 flap that was going on in France at the time you had these a lot of these sightings uh, all over the place of people seeing like classic saucer shaped UFOs people in or, uh, occupants wearing like diving suits is what they said yeah. you know over and over again so uh, yeah that was probably one of the more fascinating uh, cases to come from that time and uh, I think uh, really the um, the cool thing was is that Amy Michelle, who was one of the original investigators of that flap, was actually able to trace all of these sightings in basically straight lines. They could track them so easily from place to place to place to place, which was, you know, really fascinating. And uh, yeah, it's just a classic case. Love that case. <laughs> yeah, I James is that his name, Magaha? Yeah. yeah. I hate that dude. I'm sorry. I'm just going to say it. You know, he does, he does know, 
he doesn't even look into the case. He's just got his sound bites ready to go whenever they have him on the news or, you know, commenting on these things. I remember watching something recently where they had James Fox on after one of his documentaries came out. And the dude wouldn't even let James get a word in edgewise until James just flat out took him down right then and there. So that was that was nice to see finally that someone told this guy, why don't you actually look into the case that you're debunking immediately before you know, passing judgment. He, he gives scientists a really bad name when it comes to UFOs because he turns off the science when he, uh, you know, gives an opinion about a UFO sighting. Yeah. He disregards any sort of evidence there is to the case and just spouts off what the first thing that comes to his mind without even looking into the details of the case. Yeah, pigeonholing your own your thought process in, is, process in is something without regard for what's actually going on is just as bad as being a yes man on the whole topic. And, you know, that's the whole Philip J. Class school of debunking there, even though Philip at least did research, <laughs> you know, before he, yeah, it, before he spat it, it off. A little it bit, seems, yeah. It seems, right. like, it seems like one of those cases where, you know, there's such more compelling and interesting um, ulterior explanations for these things. You know what I mean? And even, like, the, the fact that it's silicon and boron together in these strands... That to me sounds like borosilicate glass, right? Or borosilicate strands. Um, I was just going to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which would be, <laughs> you know, which would be these, which would be interesting in that area. I mean, you know, um, I mean, it could be all kinds of different things, right? That are, that's kind of going out there and hitting the wind and whatever. And like spider webs are occasionally used for an explanation for like angel hair or what's called um, star jelly. Right is another name for the same kind of thing. Yeah. But yeah, to use that to try to explain away like loads of people seeing something and then saying, no, everyone in that crowd thought it was an alien, but it was actually a uh, spiders. That's almost scarier to me, though, too. Spiders flying around like this. Yeah. I'm not into I, that. Just I, I deeply, think too deeply not into that. I don't know, man. <laughs> not cool. Especially on that grand of a scale. I mean, they saw multiple like what they thought were craft in the sky. I mean, I have no idea what the size of these things were, but yes, that is horror movie terrifying. Seriously, right? Like, not fun. Not into it at all. Like, no well, thank when you, you. When you first started, you said a, a silver egg-shaped thing came over a stadium and dropped glitter, and it sounded like the Goodyear blimp was there. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and <laughs> it took a turn, so that was a, I had never heard that one, so yeah. Yeah, I, I think, too, to point out what Chris, um, Chris was saying, a prosaic or other scientific explanation is just as fascinating as being a UFO, in my opinion. I yeah. mean, you know, I mean, take strip it of alien immediately and just say, whoa, we have a anomaly that we've probably never seen before happening here. So uh, I, I, I always go back to that. Like, it's really interesting to find a earthly explanation that could be just as astounding as um, unearthly, in my opinion. Yeah, and I mean that's that's something that that we bring up with UFO sightings all the time, right? I mean something is is a, a UFO to somebody if they're not used to seeing it. We're getting all the the Starlink uh, sightings right now reported because people aren't used to seeing this string of satellites in the sky that continues to grow all the time. Um, if you're not used to seeing something in the sky, it looks strange to you. Therefore, a UFO and how many of you have seen spiders moving through the sky on, their, on a ball of webs? Like, I've never seen that. So if I saw it, it would look really freaky to me. Yeah. One of the things that always blows my mind, just going off of what you just said, too, is when people come forward with things like that and you say, well, that actually is Skylink. Uh, it's one of the things I've seen where they go, nope, that's not what it is. And yep. they want it to be something that it's not. And I think yep. that's just human nature, though. But it right. is something that I've been seeing a lot lately. Mm. Yep. Yeah, uh, uh, like I said, uh, fascinating case. So, uh, Brent, why don't you uh, go ahead with yours, man? Yeah, so I have the August 29th of 1979 uh, truck driver incident with Harry Turner. Uh, he was woke up in Fredericksburg, VA. That was his destination where he was heading. The problem was he had no memory of getting there. And the last thing that he remembered was eating at a truck stop uh, right after he had left to go on to, to his normal haul. Then, boom, he's at the end of his route, he's parked, he's good to go. So he looks around his truck, and he sees the odometer, and it says that he's only gone 17 miles. Though, at that time, he should have went about 80 miles. Now, this is a truck driver, so they keep logs. They should be able to see exactly where they're at. 
uh, at any time, and that's something that they, if they get pulled over, they have to produce stuff like that. He also sees that uh, his gun, he carries a gun in case there's trouble brews, as you know, can, and it is laying out in the truck, and all eight shells are are loose. They've been expelled. He shot it. He's emptied the entire magazine. Uh, so that's a little bit weird when you have no memory of that. And he mm-hmm. says after that you do that, the memory starts coming back. And he remembers starting his route, and he's driving like normal for a little while. Then he sees a bright light come down from the sky, and it's kind of coming towards his truck. And it starts following him. And then, just like I think we've seen in so many things, he has electrical issues. Uh, his CB radio and his regular radio start doing static, and then, boom, this loud tone comes through. And that's when the fun starts, and by fun, I mean pant-filling terror, I think. Um, Struck is, is, is stopped, and everything there is filled with light. So he collects himself, he tries to get out of the truck, and he says that he feels something that is invisible is pushing on him, keeping him inside of his truck. Uh, he tries to get off of it, and he says that he actually quoted it saying it was like it had bionic strength. It was so strong he couldn't get out. So he grabs his gun, and he just start, starts shooting. Just empties the whole thing. And whatever's holding him back stops pushing. And so he shuts the door. He sits there for a little bit, he says. Then he decides to get out and look around. And that's when he says that he's inside of the hangar or the belly of a large UFO. And that is all he remembers at that time uh, before waking up in Fredericksburg, Virginia. But... That doesn't stop there. So that was, uh, like I said, on uh, August 29th. On September 3rd, he's laying in bed, and he's looking up at the ceiling, and all of a sudden he can see, he says, through the ceiling, and he can see the stars and stuff, like an x-ray, or he can see through what's going on. He looks, turns, looks over at his wife, and he can see her skeletal, uh, skeletal structure, like, inside of her. That's not normal. I don't know if you guys know that or not, but he takes off, (laughs) freaks him out, takes off running, ends up in a police chase that covers a couple counties. They finally stop him, and they think he's crazy. He's he's screaming about all this stuff. So they do take him into uh, the hospital to have him uh, checked out, and they do say... Uh, oh, he says that he's hearing tones in his head also, he tells him that. So they take him in, they do a complete mental and physical evaluation on the guy, and they say that he seems to be extremely sensitive to light and sound, and he lacks control on the left side of his body. Uh, that's also the side of his body that he was touched on in the truck. Um, you could say maybe, you know, that could be because of a, he had a slight stroke or something like that. MUFON, though, in this story, does start an investigation, and they go to the trucking company to kind of try to co- you know, corroborate his story to see what's going on. Because he said, and the big thing there was, like I said, he said he only went 17 miles, or the, the, the truck said that. So that means he would have had to have teleported or been picked up and placed at the destination he was going to. Truckers keep logs, so this should be an easy thing to try to figure out. And the paperwork is completely missing. They have none of his paperwork. So they look into his past, as you do, and uh, he told them that he worked, uh, he was served in the Navy. Uh, he had pics of being in the Navy. He had the sort of stuff like a veteran would have. So they request, requested his service records, and they're all gone, a la, like a Bob Lazar setup type story. Like his work records are gone, his military records are gone. Uh, Then he seems to, you know, he has a mental break. You know, he just, he went crazy. All this stuff happens. And it ends up, I mean, that's kind of the end of the story because they couldn't verify anything. And, you know, a lot of people have have tossed around ideas of this aliens, intermissional travel, um, future us (laughs) coming forward and granting him some sort of, uh, I don't know if you want to call it evolutionary thing where they can see through stuff. It's a weird story. And uh, it did have some some investigation uh, parts to it that uh, didn't really work out, uh, if we're to believe that those things are actually missing. It's uh, yeah, that's an interesting story. I've never even I've never heard that one before. Um, uh, I uh, <laughs> David Flora in here with the uh, stop too much sexiness in one stream. I appreciate that, <laughs> David. Uh, I do. 
Uh, and uh, thanks everybody for uh, tuning in, Chris. Uh, I'm I'm sorry we had to start without you, but it is what it is, dude. Got to do what you got to do in this case. And uh, Dale, uh, thanks for uh, stopping in, man. But uh, yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting case. I've, I it, it parallels a lot of uh, in in some ways a lot of uh, other cases that I've uh, well, not to cases. not be a bandwagon jumper too, but it yeah. was on Hangar One, so I had to. Go uh, yeah, that is that is true. That is true. <laughs> See a running theme here, <laughs> right? Jeez, yeah. You're never gonna live that down, bud. You are never gonna live that show down. Bro. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I love Hangar One. <laughs> <laughs> this was an interesting story to me because I actually, when I was younger, I was 18 years old and I was in a wreck, and uh, I had head trauma. Big surprise to you guys, I'm sure. But uh, I lost like a day of my life, and as time has gone by, I filled in the stuff that's happened by remembering little tidbits and I would ask you know my parents or whoever I was with if that really happened and they say yes but sometimes you don't know if you're remembering things or if you're making them up and I still don't and I think that's an important thing to remember in situations like this and I'm not saying that that's what happened here at all or that he had any sort of trauma but things like that do happen and that's kind of an interesting reason why I was was drawn into this uh, specific case completely understandable man completely understandable um I loved it, man. I loved it. I appreciate it, Brent. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm glad I could do that for you. <laughs> I like the part with the skeleton. Yeah. 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 Which is probably this. That's so. It's such a crazy because like, baby, baby, no. Right. <laughs> you're a skeleton now. Oh my god. Like, if you think about like what, um, if you think about what that means, right, in terms of what this person's actually seeing. Because, like, you don't see, like, an x-ray, you're not, you know what I mean? It's not like you actually shoot, like, like in Home Alone when he, Marv puts his hands on the washing machine. Yeah. And it's, yeah. You know what I mean? He's like, whatever, you can see his skeleton, right? Like, that doesn't happen, obviously. I think we all mm -hmm. know that. <laughs> but, like, the idea that this could, um, just thinking even, like, physically what that would mean, maybe the, I don't know, the skeleton is fluorescing for some reason or... The skin has become see-through. And he also, well, and he also said that he looked up through his ceiling. He could see through the ceiling and see the sky above him. Right. So it's a super interesting, like, just a very strange part of a story to add if you're going to make it up, you know? Right. Very right. strange. So I don't really understand, like, what the whole, um, yeah, I don't know. It's weird. Oh, yeah, weird. I guess my takeaway is if you're ever in the military, your first day, grab someone and say, remember me. Because you <laughs> never know who's going to have to come to your aid in the future and be like, I do remember that guy. It was really weird. He grabbed yeah. me. You know? So. Yeah. Pro, it's a pro tip there. If anything uh, Bob Lazar's story has taught us, you need to have those people in your life, you know, <laughs> that you can go to. <laughs> it's not going to work out. It's just not going to work out, man. No, you're going to get in trouble. No, you're no. you in trouble. I have no memory of you. <laughs> no memory, no memory at all. And like, that scares me because, you know, I work in a, in a nursing home and like, I, it, it's people with dementia and I can't even uh, imagine because we actually had to sit through a class at one point and it, they went through the process of what it's like to like forget things for some people. And like, uh, they actually made us uh, do this exercise where we wrote down, you know, some memories that we were fond of. And then they just came by and they're like, Yank, you don't remember that anymore. You don't remember that anymore. Wow, so yeah. that is, it, it's a terrifying aspect of, of uh, being a human is just like one day waking up and you don't remember a damn thing. <laughs> no, thank you. No, thank yeah. you. So, uh, uh, Chris, how about you grace us with your story, man? <laughs> hey, I got a great story. Oh, man. All right. <laughs> So my story, um, so my story is a really interesting one because, or at least I think it's interesting. We'll be um, the judge of that. Yeah, I was going to say, you guys will tell me whether or not it's interesting or not, right? This is the worst story I've ever heard. Um, you guys can write mean comments in the chat. Um, so anyways, um, so my story actually is one that's pretty, was really popular back in the day. And the reason I like to highlight it, and it's similar to other stories similar to this, like, um, so originally I was actually going to do the Nuremberg mass sighting because that's another one of these sorts of cases that wasn't popular until suddenly it was because someone put it out there, right? Mm. Like a big name put it out there. 
So the story that I'm talking about is what's known as the Great Kansas Cow Napping. Um, so, okay, here is the quote here that was part of a, um, it got a, kind of got all over the place back in like the late 1800s, like really like 1890s actually. So this was printed initially April 23, 1897. So, and then, yeah, there's the sweet photo here of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of gilding the little, yeah, we're, we're just telling the story immediately here. It is a hoax, yes. right? A famous hoax in ufology. Okay, so uh, this is from Alexander Hamilton, the guy's actual name, not like the president or not the president, but the, uh, the secretary of the treasury. <laughs> the treasury, whatever the hell he was, yeah. Um, I got a PhD, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, chemical engineering, though, it's not in American history. All right, so quote, um, last Monday night, about 1030, we were awakened by a noise among the cattle. I arose thinking that perhaps my bulldog was performing pranks, but upon going to the door, saw to my utter astonishment that an airship was slowly descending upon my cow lot, about 40 rods, which evidently is 600 feet from the house. Um, calling my tenant Gid Heslip, which awesome 1800s name Gid, and my son Wall, again, amazing name. His son's name is Wall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, his sister's name is Chair. We seized some axes and ran to the coral. Meanwhile, the ship had been gently descending until it was not more than 30 feet above the ground, and we came within 50 yards of it. It consisted of a great cigar-shaped portion, possibly 300 feet long, with a carriage underneath. The carriage was made of glass or some other transparent substance, alternating with a narrow strip of some material. It was brightly lighted within, and everything was plainly visible. It was occupied by six of the strangest beings I ever saw. They were jabbering together, but we could not understand a word they said. Every part of the vessel, which was not transparent, was of a dark reddish color. We stood mute with wonder and fright. Then some noise attracted their attention, and they turned a light directly upon us. Immediately on catching sight of us, they turned on some unknown power, and a great turbine wheel, about 30 feet in diameter, which was revolving slowly below the craft, began to buzz, and the vessel rose lightly as a bird. When about 300 feet above us, it seemed to pause and to hover directly above a two-year-old heifer, which was bawling and jumping, apparently fast in the fence. Going to her, we found some material fastened in a slip knot around her neck, and going up to the vessel from the heifer tangled in the wire fence. We tried to get it off, but could not, so we cut the wire loose to see the ship, heifer, heifer and all rise slowly, disappearing in the northwest. We went home, but I was so frightened I could not sleep. Rising early Tuesday, I started out on my horse, hoping to find some trace of my cow. This I failed to do, but coming back in the evening, found that Link Thomas, about three or four miles west of Leroy, had found the hide, legs, and head in his field that day. He, thinking that someone had butchered a stolen beast, had brought the hide to town for identification, but was greatly mystified at not being able to find any tracks in the soft ground. After identifying the hide in my brain, I went home. But every time I would drop to sleep, I would see the cursed thing with its big lights and hideous people. I don't know whether they are devils or angels or what, but we all saw them, and my whole family saw the ship, and I don't want any more to do with them. That was then actually uh, put into the newspapers with an affidavit that was sworn um, by around 12 different people who were like, so this is the, rate, the, the list of these people, ready? E.V. Wharton, State Oil Inspector, Emmy Hunt Sheriff, H.H. H. Winter Banker, um, E.K. Kellenberger, M.D., uh, a pharmacist, an attorney, justice of the peace, two druggists, the register of deeds, the postmaster, and the deputy sheriff. Now, so this story came out and was a huge deal, right? It was part of what's known as the um, part of what's known as the airship flap, which mm -hmm. happened in the like 1850s to like the 1920s, essentially in the United States, especially. And I love this story for a bunch of different reasons. One is the fact that this guy could imagine an airship that would like float and have this big glass case and everything else, but he couldn't think of a way to get a cow up into it without just like a rope. You know what I mean? <laughs> he lacked that imagination to be like, oh, then they used a rope and they got the cow and they drug it. You know, they, they had it floating in the air with us. Like he couldn't think of that at all. But the other reason why this is so fascinating is so it hit, it really hit the, um, it hit the national newspapers. It got all over the place. And then it fell off, like the story kind of died down. It was forgotten a little bit until it was brought back up by uh, Jacques Vallée, actually, um, who wrote mm -hmm. about it. And then it was also part of a couple of, after he wrote about it in like the 60s, it became a huge, huge UFO story again. 
And so people started to, um, what's the word? It, it basically was almost like the, for cow mutilation, what Roswell became, right? Mm -hmm. Nowhere near as big as Roswell, but it, it was like a foundational case in UFO history and lore, right? Until they started looking into it. Here is the quote from the person who initially published the article. So initially it was published in the Gates Center Farmers Advocate. And so this is from um, Ed F. Hudson, who was the editor of that story. So quote, I had just bought and installed a little gasoline engine, the first I believe to come to Gates Center, using it to run my machinery, replacing the hand power on the old country Campbell press and kicking the job presses. I invited many of my friends in the back shop to see the engine work. Hamilton, the original person, Alexander Hamilton, was one of them. He exclaimed, now they can fly. And there the airship story we made up took birth. <laughs> this guy, Hamilton, was part of a little known Midwestern tradition called a liar's club. Mm -hmm. These groups existed in the United States in the 1850s all the way to like the 1950s. And actually they still do exist today. Um, there's a famous one in Wisconsin still that's, that's operational. I don't know if you've heard of another one that's pretty... Uh, in Chicago, right? Uh, well, Facebook, we call it. <laughs> oh, okay. there's, there's also, okay, there's like a bar in Chicago mm. called Liars Club, I guess. No. Ever Brent? Okay, yeah. Facebook, that was good. <laughs> All right, now I look like a butthole. Thanks. <laughs> I look like a fool. Um, so these Liars Clubs, though, what they would do, it would be a bunch of rich guys that would get together, and they would see how far they could get a tall tale to travel through their town. And this is one of those tall tales, mm -hmm. right? That's that seemed to travel around. And if that wasn't enough of a, um, if that wasn't enough of a kind of proof that this was a falsified hoax story, um, one of Alexander Hamilton's uh, relations from back in the day, like um, I think it was like his his secretary or someone that worked for him or whatever, she remembered her mom talking all about how they used to make up these crazy stories on how yeah. one of them even ended up in the French newspapers. Right about a cow that had been cow napped out of this field in, in Kansas, um, or out of, uh, you know, uh, what what's it this this area that they lived in? So it's such for me, it's such an interesting story, and it's one too that shows it. That story just fell off the UFO folklore, mm -hmm. you know, map, right after it was proven that this was like a hoax, it fell off. But if you still read up about it, like on UFO blogs and things, um, people are still trying to like prove that it's true. Yeah. Which is crazy. Yeah. Like, Isn't that the case with every UFO case? It is. It is. But it, it's like, it's such an interesting, um, it's such an interesting thing that, you know, it's such an interesting thing to me that this, these people then come out and they're like, yeah, we made it up. And even Hamilton evidently, like at the time was a really well known, he'd make up these tall tales constantly. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but it was just because of his fancy title and his affidavit, affidavit, affidavit that was sworn to by everyone else right. affidavit, affidavit, affidavit. Yeah. um it was only from this thing that people were like oh man this guy's gonna be telling the truth but nah <laughs> yeah it always um, blows my Go ahead, uh, sorry. yeah just wanted to say uh william poland has a great point here uh bringing up the aurora texas crash because that seemed to be a case that was really strong for a number of years until uh i think it was what like the the new york uh maybe like time magazine or something like that interviewed some of the like family members and some of the original witnesses and said, no, it was complete bunk. You know, it was uh, a situation in which, you know, the town wasn't doing good. So we're going to, you know, kind of drum up some uh, tourism here by saying that a U fake UFO crashed on judge Proctor's property and all that stuff. It, it, same kind of thing. And uh, it, it kind of goes to show like considering the, 1896 and 1897 it's kind of like the first flap there's a lot of similar things that have gone forward in the flaps of the modern age in which people hoax things it's great it's fantastic uh i think my my favorite one of my favorite hoaxes is the um woodworth saucer hoax of uh 1947 in which these kids uh this was shortly after uh kenneth arnold had his sighting and the uh, whole UFO boom really kicked off. They ended up making like a fake UFO out of materials and they basically put it in this woman's on this woman's yard and she was like the town gossip. So word spread fast. The uh, 
I believe the the military was there within like uh, a few hours, and like <laughs> these kids got in trouble for for doing this. So so great, gotta gotta love it. But uh, yeah, man, with, with every with every flap, there's bound to be hoaxing. So, you know, that actually reminds me. I don't know why I thought this would be so funny, but it was really funny at the time. I swear, <laughs> when I was a kid, me and my friend Richie were walking home from the train station, walking home from high school, and someone was throwing away a mailbox. And we thought it'd be really funny to take the mailbox and just put it on some random person's like stoop, <laughs> right? Like on, on their, you know, on their entryway, I guess, like into their house. And so we did that. And then they, they found out it was us. And so we were sitting on my stoop, just like hanging out and being stupid. And the person came and started yelling at us, like, you put this mailbox on my stoop. And we were just like, no, no, why would we do that? That's such a weird thing for you to accuse us of. Like, I, I was a little, I was a craphead. <laughs> no, I like it's such I, a weird like I don't know it's it's such a odd like a uh, mischief uh, god mischief. I remember when we recorded that uh, Arcapalooza and I heard about many of the stories of you running around with bad groups of kids Christopher my gosh I'm chaotic evil man I'm telling you, <laughs> it's not good it's like not a great thing um, overall <laughs> Marie is like the, the the anchor that keeps me linked to reality at this point I think Christopher um, Cogswell putting his D and D alignment right out into the world. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, Ryan beaming down for just a sec to thank our sponsor, HelloFresh. HelloFresh cuts out stressful meal planning and grocery store trips, so you can enjoy cooking and get dinner on the table in less than thirty minutes. HelloFresh has been named Newsweek's most trusted meal kit company of 2021, with over 4 million households served. It's cheaper than shopping at the grocery store and cheaper than eating at a restaurant. And I know just like most of you, my hectic schedule doesn't leave much time to prepare healthy meals, but not with HelloFresh. Now I enjoy healthy dinners like their Mediterranean baked vegetable dish and the Cajun pork sausage stuffed peppers. And listeners of Somewhere in the Skies are getting an exclusive deal right now. Go to HelloFresh.com slash Somewhere12 and use the code Somewhere12 for 12 free meals, including free shipping. Again, that's HelloFresh.com slash Somewhere12 and use the promo code Somewhere12 for two weeks worth of amazing meals for free. Thank you again, HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit, and possibly the galaxies. All right, beam me back up, guys. And now, back to the show. It always it always cracks me up or, or surprises me, I think, with in these stories, what ones fall by the wayside and what ones refuse to because people just latch on to them. And it... it in the conspiracy world, too, it's not just stuff like this. You can look at um, Polybius and Lake City Quiet Pills and stuff like that, that you can go down these roads and debunk them pretty easily, but people just go, nope, I want to believe this. Does it hurt people to do that? Uh, no, but it also doesn't do any good, and it sure doesn't give any credence to what we're trying to do. Yeah. 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 I, I, um, I remember I was at a uh, conference where um, Aaron Goyas spoke, and he gave this fascinating presentation about the repackaging of ufology from decade to decade. And it was stunning to hear someone from like the early airship days up to like the recent sightings. Um, he was able to trace the same story, the same incident repackaged throughout every decade. And it, it blew my mind. So, I mean, that ha that has every UFO researcher questioning every case they've ever looked at and be like, what earlier version of this is this? Or mm -hmm. how was it built upon? I mean, I talked to, to Micah Hanks recently, who's doing a lot of research of UFOs in antiquity times. And I thought I brought a really fascinating case to him of a floating ship in the sky that drops an anchor. Dude comes down, mm -hmm. he's floating in midair, checking stuff out. People in a church are outside looking at this. Um, the bishop's like, ah, oh, let him do his thing. Let him do his thing. If it's a heavenly figure, let him do his thing. Um, dude, he's so, got an anchor. Yeah, he's got a. <laughs> an no, one, no one evil has an anchor. Right. Oh, totally but, get this, Chris. He, um, the anchor 
as the guy climbs back up into the airship, the anchor falls down, you know, to the land. And this church claims that they have the anchor to this day. So I thought this was really interesting. But then as soon as Micah heard it, I saw him grinning. And he told me four other stories of that. The old yeah. anchor story. The old anchor story, as it were. So, yeah, this idea of repackaging is fascinating. I think yeah. it's, you know, something that um, we have to be really careful of, I think. One creepy of the... pasta is not a new thing, it turns out. <laughs> no, right. actually, it's, it's actually really interesting, right? Uh, one of the most uh, well-documented versions of this is with witchcraft stories or the shift from a purely demonic worldview or a so in okay in like religious like the okay, not really theology but like in philosophy of say like science i guess but pre-science when science was still demons and angels and stuff whatever there was this idea of um something could be supernatural but then also preternatural and so oh brent's brent's dead brent has disappeared I where'd guess. you go brent i don't know what happened to brent you now, offended him. I really offended him. He was like, witches are, are real. They're real. Not having any part in a witch conversation. <laughs> right. It's like if, if I brought up a Ouija board, you would be like, no. Um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna plow ahead because this is what I do when people stop listening to me. I just plow ahead. Yeah, that's your thing, God as well. Um so this um it's, so preternatural preternatural suggests that something is natural, it fits within the bounds of natural law. But it's just like happening in a way that we don't know about before, right? Supernatural suggests that something goes against the laws of nature that humans have to work by. So a lot of theologians argued that like the only thing that could be supernatural was God, right? Because if it was anything else, then God wouldn't be all powerful and therefore he wouldn't he or she wouldn't be God, right? So God has to be the only thing that can be supernatural. Um on the other hand, preternatural would be like flash right like the flash could do things that we would think would be like demonic or like magical or whatever but it's just that he's super fast right but his body still like he can't go through walls he can't teleport he can't you know be telepathic whatever right so um the shift was that it started off where demons and witches were supernatural and then we started saying no no that's ridiculous they're just super strong and fast like really smart or whatever and so we went from them being supernatural, then being preternatural, to then them being unnatural, right? They didn't exist in the natural world. But a lot of those ideas that we still gave to like witches, like the witches' Sabbath, being abducted from bed at night, all of other things, um, continued into modern folklore. And you can argue one way or the other, like, do you think that this is because people were being abducted by aliens since then, and we just called them witches, or they're not really aliens, or other larger thing, or whatever. But that story it's like one of the best cases where we have that example of the change because so many um like say thomas aquinas and others really looked at it seriously and were like this is a problem because i guess they thought they would see a demon someday they were really concerned about knowing what was going on mm. yeah it, it reminds me of um the stuff that like diana pasolka and uh, leslie kane were looking Absolutely, at yeah. with um the pentagon program and the dia like they had a group in there a splinter group almost um looking at this from a religious angle and like that was the only way they were looking at it which ultimately affects all the research moving forward if you're putting this demonic angle on the whole thing so i thought that's fascinating that chris this is even going on with the freaking atip program it's crazy go don't get me started on atip bro <laughs> sorry well, I, I I think, you know, some of this really highlights something that I'm a firm believer in, and that is knowing UFO history and not being afraid to revisit and learn UFO history. I know people in, in the UFO field can get a lot of shit for, you know, if you ever decide to do a show on Roswell. I mean, God mm -hmm. forbid, don't touch Roswell. Why do we care about listening about uh, this old case from 1947? But I think there are a lot of people entering the ufo field now and even people who have been in the ufo field for a long time who you know haven't looked at some of these cases for for decades and you know it helps to bring these things back up and remind people some of the history of these cases because i mean there are just like some of the cases we've mentioned there's so many cases that come up that have been thoroughly debunked and you know the people involved in them have admitted <laughs> perpetrating mm -hmm. these things yet there are so many people who come to us now and say oh well, what about this case i think this is a compelling case 
you know, so there's a, there's this need, I think, for some proper education and revisiting historical cases to help people be, be better informed with a lot of these things. Cause I mean, guys, give me a break. We're still seeing stuff about alien autopsy. I can't oh, believe God. that made a resurgence. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, this is a big problem. So I got a lot of love for history and revisiting historical cases frequently. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think like one of the uh, cases that has been a great example of that lately is the, um, the Aztec crash because it's come back into the uh, kind of the forefront uh, in, in a certain way. And uh, it was a case that was dismissed. I mean, um, <clears throat> Frank Scully, you know, <laughs> God love him, but uh, nobody was buying his stuff back in the day. But, you know, you, you've got these two researchers that go back in and, you know, look at this case and say, well, maybe there is something there. So, yeah, I, I agree. Like, I think one of the joys about having a, a UFO podcast and going back and looking at these cases, like diving into the old issues of like flying saucer review, seeing how these stories evolved is, is so in, in I, you know, eye opening in many ways. And um, with, with my story, that's uh, it's kind of that way for me. So I'll, I'll kick into my story now. Uh, mine comes from Finland and uh, right up front, I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to butcher these pronunciations just because I do not speak Finnish. According to Ancestry for about six months, I was 5% Finnish, but I do not believe it for one second. I am not buying it. But uh, in the late 60s and early 70s in Finland, uh, there were a lot of um, there was a civilian UFO groups that were looking into the UFO activity of that time. And there was kind of an escalation in cases. And this is probably one of the most well-known cases, but it was still kind of uh, a little more obscure to me at the time. But uh, this case involves two men, Arno Heinonen and Esko Vilho, who were cross-country skiing in the t village of I, it, Im Jarvi is how you. It looks like it's pronounced, it, not pronounced, but spelled. Im Jarvi. Some village. Yeah, it's um, it's a very small village. Um, it's uh, located near the town named Heinola. Uh, again, my pronunciations are terrible. So, this story went through a few phases in its retelling. It's uh, it first appeared in the pages of Flying Saucer Review in their May June issue of 1970. And uh, it was approximately 4.45 p.m. on January 7th, 1970. And the skies were clear. The, the temperature was beginning to drop as the uh, stars began to come out for the night. And despite the now frigid temperatures, it had really been a beautiful day for skiing. And Heinonen, who was uh, 36 years old, he worked in forestry. And Vilho, who was 38, he was a farmer by trade. Uh, the pair were uh, avid cross-country skiers for years. And they had just crested this hill when Arno first heard this strange buzzing sound. But it was Esco that actually was the first person to sight this thing. And uh, in the original reports, it was described as a thin, narrow point of light. And this light was what the men called the phenomenon at the time. And it exploded into a cloud that was quote, brighter than the moon. It descended below treetop level and it came um, and it, and from it came a ring of white light that fell to the snow and its outer edges were black. And it began to emit this red, these red, green and violet sparks on the snow. The, the ring measured approximately 50 centimeters or about a foot and a half in diameter. And from this ring, a small disc would come from it and it, it would lift up back up into this, uh, this uh, cloud that was uh, right above it. And, you know, it, it was really small. It was only 20 centimeters. And then this cloud lifted up and disappeared rapidly. And what makes this case what it is, is the effects that these two skiers were having after it. So they, these negative health effects uh, took place almost immediately. Uh, Arno's right side, which uh, had been facing this uh, weird looking cloud, felt like really hot. 
it became numb and it was actually difficult for for him to breathe for a time and his like went at a certain point too uh he struggled to get back to hanalo himself and uh the doctor only prescribed him with some sleeping pills uh he couldn't find anything wrong with him at the time and uh he would make multiple trips uh over like the next two weeks to the doctor uh similarly uh esco would have um his face got very swollen and red he described feeling light in the legs which was throwing off his balance and the doctor too prescribed him sleeping pills because he couldn't find anything wrong with him which is wild you know you got these guys with these wild symptoms and they can't find anything wrong with you Hell and, of a doctor yeah just crack doctor man <laughs> just crack doctor in here <laughs> um but uh through multiple trips esco complained of eye pain and headaches for which he was prescribed eye drops both men were pres- prescribed blood circulation medication at one point and still the doctors could find nothing wrong with him but the story continues to evolve a little bit and in the next issue of flying saucer review um the story um it, 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 little more you know some more details start coming out so the sound that arno heard initially he said it sounded like it was really further away and then he heard it coming closer and they described how when they were watching this they were kind of paralyzed to the spot they weren't afraid of what they were seeing but they couldn't really move so this explosive cloud would gain structure as a classic saucer with three half balls of light on the bottom of it. And in the center of it was a tube of light that was a little bit larger. And from this strange self-luminous ring of light, the, it, it would emit this, this ring and with these black edges on it. But like the saucer itself... Um, it's kind of in a way like a George Adamski kind of description, but like its features are kind of smoother going up and everything. They're rounded. So Arno spoke of having strange dreams in which this object was descending toward him. And his friend Esco looked very different in these dreams. He was older, he was shorter and whatever this image was, it scared this guy so much that he encouraged his friend not to visit him (laughs) so uh this clearly you know is having this great effect on these guys their health still hadn't improved um esco's hands and face would still become red and he'd just continued to suffer from headaches arno described feeling like there was hot water sloshing around in his stomach which would cause him to vomit like uh, a few times a day. And uh, both of their memories were kind of like failing them, but um, still doctors could not find anything wrong with these guys for whatever reason, still crack doctoring here. Great, great doctoring. So the uh, there's reports from um, Falkenberg, Sweden, concerning a craft that people had seen that were was a, of a similar shape these balls on the on the bottom of them of light and and stuff like that um but it was finally in september that the full story would emerge um and word of the men's story had started to get out and journalists came a knocking in fact there was one that uh, showed up at these guys' doors and basically said, you tell us your full story. You're not telling us the full story. So these two guys, they blamed memory loss incurred during the incident for why they couldn't remember what was happening to them. But uh, in the aftermath of the sighting, uh, the, these details would emerge. The object had approached from the north. These two men had stopped briefly for a rest in the, in the chill of this early evening air, a strange buzzing noise. That was the first thing. And it drew closer and closer. And Arno, yeah, he was the first to notice it. And then Esco was the first to notice the actual object itself. Um, it was a powerful light that hovered high above these skiers. And it was shrouded in this really strange cloud. But from the bottom of it, they could see these tiny, these balls of light on and uh, around the perimeter in this light tube. 
it was kind of separated by three hemispheres. But as it descended, this mist was starting to dissipate a little bit. And when it came down, it was hovering just like 13 feet off the ground, four meters or so. And Arno claimed that it was so close he could have touched it with his ski pole. The object emitted an intense beam of light down at the ground, which created a self-luminous circle with dark edges, like we've, like I've said before. And the circle started to emit red and green violet sparks and arcs that would shoot as far as three meters or about 10 feet. They talked about how it, they just about landed at their feet. And a red-gray mist descended upon the forest at the same time. And from this luminous circle, the, the small disc-like object ascended back up toward the craft. And Arno, at this point, felt like somebody had seized him by the waist and pulled him back. It was some unseen force. He couldn't really make heads or tails of it. But through the mist, he and Esco caught sight of a short humanoid creature about 90 centimeters tall or about three feet. Its features were very thin. Its nose was a, a really odd shape. It was hook shaped. It, like think of like Squidward if it was like angled instead of just like falling down. But uh, its scale was it, its skin was very pale, but. Uh, very little of it was exposed because the creature wore a covering that was green in cover and its feet were covered in the in a darker green fabric. And uh, what's interesting and fun about this creature is it um, it wore a conical hat. It kind of gave it a Rankin Bass Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer elf appearance, which is great. I, I, I love this visual and uh, I'll, I'll share this with you guys uh, right now. Let me let me get the. Uh, appropriate links up here but um uh this is yeah this is this is great right here so rob what what year did you say this was uh 1970 so this first image is of arno and esco and they're they're basically at the site where this happened they're you know uh, arno's pointing up to how how high this thing was at the time hmm. but the cool thing is, is in this issue, they have uh, this um, incident like playing out. So I'll bring this down. So at first you have this UFO. It comes down. It drops this ring here. And, you know, from it, you can see that uh, this disc fly starts flying back up. And um, if you follow it the disc goes back up into the craft and there is the short, tiny humanoid figure right there. Uh, <laughs> and, and what's interesting is it's holding a box, a black box, which is uh, kind of a motif that is uh, explored again and again through um, many accounts and stuff like that. I know like black boxes was uh, something that uh, uh, their box like things were talked about on Skinwalker Ranch and stuff like that. But uh, I'll show you guys a little closer up version of the face of this thing because it's a, it's a, another fun drawing here. But um, yeah, there you go. There's its hooked nose. It's very kind of elf-like, which is uh, which is kind of funny, you know. Um, but it looks like the dude from Doug. <laughs> the bad guy with an elf hat on. What's his name? Uh, oh, what's that guy's name with the green skin? Yeah. Um, oh, Roger. Clark. Roger. 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 Yeah. Roger. There we go. You know what? Stories like this. That story reminds me of the Utsuro Bune. Yeah. Which is this for people that don't know in the chat or you know watching or whatever? It's a famous piece of Japanese folklore where a woman, like a ship, washes ashore, um, and they get there and they see that there's a woman inside who can't speak Japanese, but she's holding like a shining box mm -hmm. that, you know, people that she says you can't touch, you can't see, whatever. Right. Um, a really interesting story. But yeah, like if it is a very similar motif and a very interesting one. Yeah. So um this creature turned slightly and aimed the box that it was holding. It's holding this black box. It's got kind of a lens as you can see there. It's uh he aims it at Arno. And this pulsating light came out of it and just like shone directly at him. Um, 
the the sparks were still flying as this thing is like shooting this guy with the, with whatever weird ass camera that he's got and um yeah the both of these guys ended up like in the beam of this in the beam of light itself and um the uh red mist started to get thicker at this point and both of the guys saw uh, you know, lost sight of this uh, creature, but uh, both men claim to have a good view of it for approximately 15 seconds. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that's just freaky. You got some weird ass elf coming down here. Like he's, you know, you're about to sit on Santa's lap. He's taking pictures. I'm not down with that, you know, at at all. But then uh, this light beam rose up from the snow and it re-entered the ship and the mist completely parted. Like, you know, someone was throwing open some curtains and there was a flash in the sky and the craft was gone. Uh, It had just completely disappeared. The physiological effects, though, would just remain for months. It was hard for both men to work in the weeks following the encounter. Yeah, Heinenden, uh, Arno, he vomited like regularly for months and uh, Esco's skin was just turning red all the time. Um and in fact, the, these guys would lead a party, including the journalists that told them to come forward, you know, and tell the true story. Um, he would have them, you know, come forward and, and bring them to the spot. And of the uh, the guys that were there, I think the majority of them, their skin started to turn red and it was irritated. So, uh, you know, there is some skeptical views of this case. I don't really think they hold water. Um, Maybe they were exposed to like, I don't know. In this case, I'm not exactly sure what they would have been exposed to, but it's one of the, well, it's one of those cases where that is a hell of a hoax. If it makes the guy puke continuously for, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, whoa, like what did, what did, what was he hoaxed? You got to commit to that. Yeah. Yeah. Seriously. That's like, that's no joke. Right. I mean, Outside of some like intense sort of like ang- you know anxiety issue that's underlying or something, um, what makes uh, I don't know. How can I cover my bulimia? I mean, seriously, yeah, <laughs> like, you know, right? like yeah. no, it's all UFO. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, wait, at least some weight. Yeah, yeah just say exactly. you don't like. I don't know. It's such a weird, uh, so Rob, strange. Rob, yeah. I was wondering if I could bring up. You just did an episode about the Falcon Lake incident, and dude, this is like strikingly mm-hmm. similar in terms of physi- uh, physiological effects. I mean, Stan yeah. Mikulak had like, you know, the radiation burns. He was vomiting, I believe, for months. And the same thing where these doctors like didn't do anything for him. They gave him like some pain meds and were like, get out of here, man. Um, I find this case eerily similar to that one. It's really interesting. Yeah, there there are a lot of similarities to it, and uh, I'm not going to get into it on uh, on this live stream. I might do an additional episode um, or something. But uh, these guys claim to have further contact with like alien beings after this, so the story kind of goes off the rails. But the interesting thing is, is that um, there were additional sightings in the area at. Uh, at or you know near the the time of this incident um but um in a village uh, 15 kilometers or nine miles from the encounter a woman named elna satari witnessed a strange light on the day the two skiers uh had their encounter and uh in the village of paso some is like 10 kilometers away about six miles an unnamed man witnessed a strange light in the sky around 4 to 45 that evening at uh, the same time the encounter took place. So, you know, these, these folks are witnessing stuff not not too far away. And uh, later that evening, a 16-year-old boy named Maddie, who was from Imjarvi, uh, witnessed a strange light not far from where the encounter took place itself. He was on his way home from a friend's house when the forest just lit up all around him. He witnessed a bright light above the trees moving about, and it disappeared not long after he caught sight of it uh, heading to the south. So uh, for this live stream, that is the Imjarvi humanoid sightings. It's um, You can see a lot of parallels in cases where people have had um, 
negative health effects after coming into contact with a, a craft of some kind like that. Uh, I, I think of uh, the Cash Landerman incident because there's a lot of similarities there. Uh, there there's just the you know a smattering um, here and there of cases like that. But uh, I just want to say if uh, any alien watching this. We don't want your Santa Claus photos, so please do not come <laughs> down. And I, I, don't, I don't. I don't. I don't know. I, I'll entertain it. You know, don't throw me in there. No. <laughs> <laughs> Brent is looking for more. He wants yeah. the negative health don't effects. Imme- don't immediately put Brent in that category yeah. of not wanting Santa photos. Like yeah. <laughs> You might want them. You might absolutely want them. He might actually want the photos. That's fine. Maybe you could play Alien Santa, Brent. That, that Maybe. Would be cool. yeah. Maybe. Yeah. We were just talking to some pilots for an upcoming episode on ours, and that's funny. That was the the term they used to use that they no longer use, is if you saw something, you'd say, we spotted Santa Claus. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> now it's kind of gone by the wayside, but yeah. Nice. I, I got the height to be your elf, Brent, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> apparently apparently ryan fits in pockets i did i never knew this until today <laughs> but, but pocket that's, size yeah that's amazing so uh i'm gonna turn this to the uh listeners here the people turn, tuning in uh if you have any questions uh throw throw them our way right now um we'll, we'll answer them so um if uh and if any aliens want to drop off some pancakes i'm down with it we just want your alien pancakes. We want your alien pancakes. That's if you could, what we want, people. If you could add a little salt, you know, I, I, I would be appreciative. You know, I don't, I don't want valet writing about my space pancakes. Okay, <laughs> I like him. He's a good dude, but he's uh, a good guy. Hey, Rob, I was, I was curious. Would um the name of the panel I think is pretty intriguing. Um. Would you mind describing that for us? The the blue ribbon. Yeah, yeah. The blue ribbon panel. I had, so, I had a couple of people ask me what that meant. Yeah. So um, back in the seventies, the National Enquirer had a panel of UFO experts that they assembled, and they would hand out a prize for someone who would come forth with proof of you know the UFO, an authentic UFO incident, or uh, you know contact with an alien and stuff like that. Uh, famous winners of the blue ribbon prize include uh, uh, Ronnie Johnson of the Delphos ring incident and uh, Travis Walton. He won uh, $5,000 for his story and it, it's been used as a tool to debunk a very famous UFO sighting. So I thought it would be appropriate if we called ourselves the blue ribbon panel. <laughs> Love it. I, I thought it was a PBR. Uh, yeah. Call out, but I guess yeah, I brought <laughs> Bust out the paps next time. Yeah. We'll be good to go. <laughs> so uh, William William Pullen asks, why are charlatans, hoaxers, and frauds embraced by the UFO community? You know, honestly, I got a great answer I, for that. But. Yeah, wait. So honestly, I'm so I, I don't know how I got part of this, um, but I got I got added in a in the thing about Skinwalker Ranch, and so I'll tell you why. Because and I'll, I'll give you. I mean, you know, you can read the thread, whatever. I'll tell you why. The reason that they are embraced in the UFO community is because a lot of the time what people in the UFO community want is not proof. They want belief. They want to be told, just believe everything I say, Mm -hmm. follow me, share the videos, listen to the stuff, do what I tell you to do. And people love that stuff. That's true. And it's like Jason was saying earlier. Um we need to look at these things or they're doomed to repeat themselves. And Absolutely. if you guys have been looking at the things that are going on now, we see the same people that are known disinformation agents are now poking their heads back up and being embraced by people again, that we should have seen through or not be doing this 25, 30 okay. years ago. And the fact that that is being something that we're having to go through again and be like, why are you doing this and getting pushback blows my mind. Yeah. So I Jason, I think that was an incredible, incredibly important point in a reason why we look at cases because no matter what it's someone's first time a lot of times when you're doing it and if not uh things like that get you know yeah we we doom to repeat itself as you know the old saying yeah Yeah. and chris is absolutely right there are always people i mean that's that's really primarily what this field is it's based on belief you have to make determinations for yourself who you find credible and who you don't um 
and what information you're going or what what evidence or what what tidbits you're going to consider evidence and add that to your pile as you're evaluating these cases on an individual basis. But like Chris said, people are looking, some people, many people are looking for answers and you're going to find somebody who is spouting the answers that you want to hear and people will gravitate toward that camp and then cults spring up. And that's really what you have around a lot of these people because people gravitate toward the person saying the thing they want to hear that supports their pre-existing beliefs. And they're going to follow that person no matter what everybody else and the evidence say about this person. They're hearing what they want to hear. Now subtract the UFO out of that and put in politics. Religion, anything, mm-hmm. anything, family life, you, anything. It's the same. It's people, human. people gravitate toward what they want to hear, what supports yeah. their beliefs in anything. Absolutely. And that's why I think it's so important too, that we like, we have things like this, or at least we have shows like what, you know, not to toot all of our own collective horns, right. But telling these stories and re investigating them and seeing like, that's how any field of knowledge is built. Mm -hmm. Right. When you start to study a science, you're not just given like a Bunsen burner and some chemicals and you're told like, well, get it all yourself. Right. You learn what people did before you and you build off of that initial study. You build off that initial storyline. And so by not allowing that to happen or by never having like a standard set of, well, this is probably what happened with these cases that came 50 years ago. This is what we can learn from them. This is how we can, you know, philosophy is a great example of this. Philosophy is always reimagining old texts. You know, the fact that people still write PhDs on like David Hume, you know what I mean? Or Emmanuel Connor or these other philosophers who wrote hundreds of years ago seems crazy, but it's because there's always reimagining. There's always new interpretations. Something similar could happen in in a field like this if we wanted it to be taken seriously. Um, And again, even if, you know, not everyone on this, on this panel agrees at the underlying reality of the phenomena that we're describing. Not everyone agrees even on um, specific cases, right? Mm -hmm. Like we, we tend to broadly agree, I would say, but generally like there's a big gap there or a big difference here on what we believe individually, but we're still able to at least look at this in a semi-intelligent way Right. And say like, this makes yeah. sense. This doesn't make sense. This seems logical. This seems illogical. Um, you can still pick apart arguments that way without needing proof. Quote right. Yeah, Chris. And that's why I'm so pissed that the fucking MUFON shit fell through because we were set up to fucking do that, man. We were set up to fucking get it in the front, get it in the back here and fucking wow. like really run these goddamn cases through their paces and, and pick out the really good shit. Yeah. And- I, th- I think that was probably the only, like, that has got to be the only time where, like, I, I think anybody has come that close to, to doing that, which, a- again, it just frustrates me endlessly. But You know, uh, it's, it's actually, I think, going to be one of the more, so you guys all know my view, my views on Into the Stars Academy, yeah. right, obviously. Yeah. Um, it's actually one of the things that I'm probably the most excited about with if they do end up doing this uap reporting app that they're talking about mm-hmm. if there was even just a, some kind of feature on there that was essentially like you could upvote or downvote a case right do you know what i mean right um at least maybe that would get people out of their like weird pigeonholes of you know what i mean like everyone on the same facebook group shared the same stories about angels yeah and they're all like oh they're aliens right like Right. Not everyone thinks that there's a lot of conflicting evidence out there for the and end. and I think that also speaks to the the field of investigators today, where you know it's a, a lot of them are like Buffon field mm-hmm. investigators, which only goes gets you so far, and it a lot of it um comes down to the passion that you have to you know for this subject and what you're willing to do to investigate it, um, but. Uh, yeah, man. Uh, I, I hope I have, you know, high hopes for that app. Um, but uh, uh, Drood in the 559 asks, any encounters in the last year you think are promising? Also, where are the girls? Don't worry. If we do this again, there will be girls involved. I, I promise. We. I, it was hastily assembled on my part, and I apologize for that. But uh, any encounters in the last year that you see is promising? There's none that really come to mind like straight away because like, again, it comes down to the fact that it, it it just seems like the, 
like the modern the 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 accounts of like that are happening within a year th they don't get a lot of spotlight they don't get a lot of press they don't get a lot of like anything they don't get a lot of coverage you know maybe you'll find one or two on a blog or or something like that but um a lot of the time i you know i'm not really looking at the the newer cases i'm more looking at the older ones that's you know more of what i do but uh, if any of you have anything in mind uh feel free to share but like that, i think that's gonna be a tough one for all of us i don't i mind a little bit out of that but chris actually helped me on this we had something that came across our desk that was interesting i had a gentleman who cleans out basements for a living and he found a stash of old uh negatives um and well they weren't negatives they were slides and the, you know, the tiny, like 110 up to, you know, normal size. And they looked like they had some of them really good UFO photos on them. He's like, he's like holding them up to the sky. And he, he called me, he's a father of a guy I went to college with. And he's like, I don't know really what this is. I usually just would just throw this away, but by God, it looks like UFOs. So he sends it to us and I got with Chris and we had them looked at and I actually had them developed to actually just digital off that. And it was someone that you could see in the 50s and 60s learning to fake UFO photos with double exposures and manipulating negatives and stuff like that. And that was really an interesting thing that, that I mean, that I came across that I was like, oh, my God, this is awesome. And then it was fake. And that was still really awesome to me because you could <laughs> see how people I know that's not the exact answer you're looking for. But that was right, the one that's when in the this last year that really got me excited was, you know, seeing how uh, the yesteryear people faked things, because that's kind of been a, a thing that we've talked about in this episode. Yeah. I, um, was this uh, Roswell Slides Part D? <laughs> you know, yeah, it was like there was actually some stuff from Vegas and some stuff from like uh, whoever had done it had taken photos from all over the nation at places where you could see like this is such and such because there's a sign in the background, you know, so like made sure that they got the the landmarks in there right. so you could see them. And they, then it was just Billy Meyer flying through the sky. You know, yeah, <laughs> they, they were, they they were legit. Crap. They were legit pretty cool. Like I'd say just generally like the the. um all those old st Scott style UFO picks like that are so sweet that like, dude, you gotta, Brent, you gotta grab them and you gotta get those, man. Yeah, I got them. I've got them. You got them. I've you got them do, all. You gotta do something with them, then. Make we all know a guy in uh, Mexico City who I'm sure would. Like <laughs> <to do that. laughs> I hear he's into alien mummies, but maybe he'd be into some old photos. I'm gonna say, Gunny, 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 the Gunny. Uh, Mummy powder, human, human remains to sell illegally. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so there's actually, I think probably the best. So actually, it's really interesting. The story went really under the radar this year, but we actually found out why most of MUFON's new cases don't go out there to the public anymore this year. Um, and it seems like it's because they are holding them to try to get documentaries made. And yeah. Stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's probably why there aren't so many new cases out there. Mm -hmm. But another reason, or I know, I, but I think that's why, for me at least, the best new cases that I've heard of have come from independent researchers like mm -hmm. like NK Cranda, who we actually had an experiencer on our show um, named Jake, who had like an um, just has an amazing story yeah. and a really interesting outlook too. You know, where he's describing um, waking up, he's describing events where he woke up and then is outside of his house. He remembers like a light taking him. He remembers waking up in a field and in trees and whatever. And then he wakes up as a kid locked outside of his home and he has to run back home and like get the door unlocked for him and everything else. Um, you know, normally that's the kind of story that I would hear and be like, yeah, okay. Right. But talking to this person and then kind of vetting his background a little bit and, um, I don't know, man. Maybe it's just because I had that personal experience with this this person and talked to them one on one. Mm -hmm. But for me, that was a story that really, I think, made a big impression on me. And actually, another one too that made a big impression on me. Sorry to like take up all the airtime here no, um, on this question, but I actually had a really interesting, a really interesting case that started when I was still with um, when I was still with Mufon, and a guy out of here in Minnesota claimed that he was being followed by craft and that his family was becoming really afraid and um, like freaking out and everything else. 
And so the investigators followed up and they took these photos and they brought him to a meeting and we all heard from him and everything else. And then it turned out that the guy was actually, when they investigated, um, they found out that all of it, he lived near a private airport. And so this was a person who was going through like a deep traumatic experience, like psychologically, um, but was seeing these craft and everything else. And he was seeing a real thing. He was seeing real things. But he was just misconstruing them. Mm. But being with or talking to the investigators and seeing how, how, how well I think they handled that and how compassionate they were. And it just, again, kind of like reinforced for me that these are real people yeah. that you need to take, at least if you can't take their story seriously, or you don't believe their story, you can at least treat them with respect, you know, yeah. and empathy um well that's the thing i think that nk Cranda does really well is she humanizes these things yeah, yeah. absolutely um, and that's important yeah yeah one um, of the most uh humanizing i guess or revelatory experience i had was at an alien con event where chris was in the audience and uh jason and i had experiencers from every spectrum bringing us stories of abductions and close encounter encounter claims and they all almost chris you you can vouch for this. Almost every one of them said, well, I'm working with this hypnotherapist. I'm working with yeah. this hypnotherapist, this hypnotherapist. And I could see Chris in the audience. I could see him getting like enraged. Like, are you effing kidding me? And it was, it was a weird moment for me up there being like, okay, I can't just tell this person like, you know, don't do that. You're but, being damaged. But, yeah. but Chris got up and he said like, I'm sorry. I just have to say this flat out. Like, um, get actual therapy because like you said someone like that gentleman was misconstruing something and was having actual traumatic experiences so were probably a lot of those experiencers at this alien con event but when you're you're in this bubble of believers for three days straight and you have actual hypnotherapists at this event doing sessions with people um that's a problem and that's a problem that i struggle with every day of talking to experiencers is you know should they do something like that? Is it ethical? Um, and what I think is the safest thing to do, and what Chris said to these people is, go to an actual therapist or work through your problems with someone. Don't go to someone who's going to say, you were abducted by aliens. You saw, um, you know, a tall white alien from the Pleiades. I, I don't know. So that was a big moment for me. Um, and I have to thank Chris for doing that. Thank you, man. Well, yeah, it's just... You know what it is? Is it's it feels like if you like Kierkegaard, there's a philosopher of of a, the, a theologian philosopher, or whatever Soren Kierkegaard, who was a Christian philosopher but also an existentialist. Or like he wasn't really he's like considered one of the earlier existentialists, but never gave himself that name or anything. But whatever. Um, but he has this like methodology of analyzing his religious beliefs by like dashing them against the hardest rocks he can find and seeing if he still believes after all of that, right? And so he has this book called um, it's called Fear and Trembling, I think. It's a really long quote at the beginning, but it's a really great piece of philosophy, and it talks about the binding of Isaac and how that – what must have that been like for um, for Isaac and for Abraham to be asked by God to, like, give up your only son and then to do it, to, just, like, try to do it and then have God come down and be like, LOL, just kidding. Oh my God, you were going to do it? That's crazy. What are you doing? Bro, bro. bro I would never ask you to do that, bro. I'm the good guy of the story. Um, right. But so, but Don't like. Sarcasm. Right, yeah. <laughs> slash ass, slash ass, bro. So, you know, in my mind, the same thing is, is true here about these beliefs. If you should try all other options first to be like, rule out all the possibilities. And if. The possible is gone. All you're left with is, is the Are you impossible. saying to use the scientific method? <laughs> Maybe I am. Maybe, Maybe I am. Minds are being blown here. Um, uh, one of the coolest things about doing, uh, being on the internal review board and like going through those cases was seeing how they were kind of investigated in real time. And one of the um, investigators that I really enjoyed his work uh is a guy named eric hartwig he's a mufon state director out of massachusetts he did impeccable work he uh he actually recorded phone calls with the witnesses which uh you know i've listened to uh many times and one case that was fascinating to me uh is this case in in 
of this graphic artist who was going home and he ended up seeing this black triangle but what was cool on it is it had like a stabilizer on it and i'll share the image with you guys here in a second because like i i i'm like blown away by this because it's like I've never heard of a black triangle with like a stabilizer on it. So I remember when you saw that you like sent the the picture all giddy on Facebook I, Messenger. I <laughs> love this. I love this picture, but uh, yeah, there it is. It's uh, got a tail fin on it, which is uh, really cool. And like uh, I listened to the uh, audio of the interview that uh, Eric Hartwig did with the guy, and he's like. I saw it, my wife saw it, a friend of mine saw it, and I'm sure many of people that were on the highway saw it that night. And uh, I think one of the uh, underlying problems with uh, these kind of mass sightings in this uh, general um, time period is that uh, unless they report it, you don't know who witnessed it, who other, who else witnessed it, which is, you know, a, a definite problem. But uh like this, this case, and there were a few others that we did. Uh, I, I really, I really loved the hell out of. But uh, so, um, moving on to another question, my uh, lead researcher Rory asks, excluding anyone on the panel, whose work within the UFO field do you find the most insightful? Hmm. No one. <laughs> Our silence says it all, I guess. <laughs> I I really like I really like William Pollen. Yeah, I mean, William, commenting yeah. in here. I love I love William Pollen. Great guy. Because our I, buddy is watching, I'll say I love him too. There we go. <laughs> yep. See, I I really like NK Cranda. I think she's doing really good we stuff. We do love you, William. I there. do think that she's doing a great job. And yeah, yeah William. I, not only am I a fan, I love that you quote yourself quoting yourself when you repost stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to be able to do that someday. So that I like. Yeah. Um, I, I'll throw a couple names out there. I think uh, Frank Kimbler is uh, the geoscientist doing amazing work on the Roswell incident. Um, still out there digging, looking for mm -hmm. shit, which is awesome yeah. and finding yeah. stuff. Um, and look, if you're looking for scientific method, that's all this guy does. So, um, and there's other MUFON field investigators. That's the other thing. Individual MUFON field investigators is one thing. MUFON as an organization is another. Mm -hmm. There different. are some incredible field mm -hmm. investigators in every right. state. Um, yeah, absolutely. Like Mr. Shane Hurd in Arizona. Hurd, just want to yes. give a shout out to Shane Hurd, who's one of our Rogue Planeteers over at Rogue Planet. Yep. Uh, Earl Gray. Who is, is the assistant one. state director of Arizona, by the way. Yep. yep. Earl's yeah. a great guy. Those two mm -hmm. are the only ones coming to mind right now for me, but... um. You know, you look at the work of Erica Lukes, um, Chase Kletsky. I mean, these are people who've been doing this for years and um, kind of get, you know, pushed down by um, the more sensational cases going on. Or for whatever reason, get pushed down by people doing what they're doing. You know, it's, it's yeah. unfortunate. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, William, uh, he has another question. Why do some UFO researchers, Daryl Sims comes to mind, never publish their investigative reports, including parties involved? That is a fantastic question. Yeah. Uh, ridicule, I think, yeah. uh, desire to not be ridiculed. Um, the reason that we pick apart everything, I, th I think, you know, a lot of times they want to protect the people that they've been through. But then again, that is also setting everyone back because if there is great research being done, we have no way to compare to other sightings, to find trends, to, to look through things like that. So it's a double-edged sword to me, at least. Mm -hmm. I, I think rainy day fund is another phrase that comes to mind yeah. too. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of researchers hold these cases so close to the chest and they're just waiting for when they can, you know, put it out there and what they can, how they can benefit from that, which is, kind of sad when you think about it um you know if if they haven't come out with something in a long time oh i'll 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 bring this out right now um so i think that's another struggle in the field is uh transparency and um and sharing information you know whenever i find something i always go to jason or rob um first to be like have you heard about this before um should i steer clear or is this something i should pursue um so yeah i think you know things like this doing panels and just like sharing information, I think is really important. And I feel like a lot of the, um, I don't, I don't ever want to put down the old guard cause we've learned everything from them and are trying to build upon them, but they're more, they're more um, reticent to keep that 
that those cases uh, in. So, um, yeah, yeah, I, that's kind of my two cents on it. I think the case is different for everybody, right? Everybody's an individual. They do different things for different reasons. And I know Daryl. Daryl's a, a sweetheart of a man. I love the guy. But, uh, yeah, I mean, William makes a good point. And his reasons for not publishing his work, I don't know what they are, so not speaking about him specifically. But others I can see is in this field you have a lot of, I guess I'll call them professional people, and then some not so professional people who you know have just picked up this topic and they're doing it and they do what they do the way they know how to do it. And they might not be in it for publicity, but even if they are, they might not think about publishing a paper or, or, or doing things a certain way. They're just doing what they do with their investigations in their own style, then going around to different conventions and things and showing off what they've discovered and or talking on TV shows and, you know, the various routes. So people do things different ways. I don't pretend to know the motives behind those, but uh, I think the obvious with some people is that they know if they were to publish and try to get peer review, they would get ripped to shreds. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and I think like when it comes to like the preeminent investigators, and some of the cases that they have worked on. And I think one that immediately comes to mind is uh, Linda Napolitano's case. Like that case kind of, I, I think, ruined the credibility of Bud Hopkins for a lot of people just because of the way that he presented his information and, and the way that, uh, you know, like, no, no, there's 22 witnesses. We don't know who the hell they are. They, they uh, contacted you anonymously through letter and, and all this stuff. And there's like some weird love triangle that's happening here. And like, I've been, I've been blasted for my uh, critical opinions of Bud Hopkins. I think he was a, a fantastic researcher. Don't get me wrong, but I think he went down a line of thinking that kind of like, I don't know, soiled it in, in, in a way, but uh, yeah, I, I th motives are, uh, you know, everybody's got a different motive in this case. And uh, we can't uh, also like leave out the fact that sometimes money has to do with it. So I'm like, all about the money. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Like uh, <laughs> speaking of uh, the, you guys are not getting paid for this. Just so you know, I am. Uh, uh, I'm, well, I'm, I'm getting interference here. My connection is breaking yeah. up. We were supposed to do later. Bye. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. But uh, yeah, like different motivations, I definitely think play a part in this. Uh, Desdemona said, "Put this panel on a shirt," and I think we should. We should definitely put this panel on a shirt. But, Just uh, make it the Mortal Kombat choose your fighter so screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I think. Here. Yeah. <laughs> I had to, I had to. Uh, but uh, I, I think this is where we're gonna we're gonna wrap it for this first edition of the blue ribbon panel. So uh, thank you all for coming on. This was this was super fun to do. It was super a lot of fun. fun. Thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah, yeah Rob. Thanks, yeah. man. So good. Absolutely. Um, yeah, folks, and um, yeah, don't forget to look up. Never support your you're... local ufologist. Yeah, support your local <laughs> ufology. Keep looking up. You never know what you'll find in our strange skies, and you never know what you'll find on your computer screen when five guys get together and just talk about UFOs <laughs> in Gray We Trust. <laughs> <laughs>